Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Nathaniel Brandon speaking. And today, I'm going to do something a little bit different on seminar than usual. Today, I have no guests. I want to talk directly and personally to you. I want to tell you about a particular technique that I use in the course of doing counseling and therapy in groups and that with experimentation I found a way that individuals and couples on their own can use this technique to explore personal problems by themselves or to improve communication between people, especially between couples, or to increase intimacy. And so I want to devote this time to telling you about the technique, telling you how it works, and suggesting ways that you might want to use it on your own. Let me begin by telling you a little anecdote that says something rather important about my idea of therapy. One day I was in the waiting room of my office and there was a very pretty seven or eight year old girl sitting in a chair waiting for her father who was inside seeing another therapist in our office. And she looked at me and she said, Mr. What do you do in there? And I thought for a minute, how can I possibly tell a seven or eight year old girl what I do when I'm counseling? And then I said to her, well, I teach people that they know all kinds of things they think they don't know. And she looked contemplative for a moment and then she smiled and she said, hey, that's pretty good. And I told her that I thought so too. I teach people that they know all sorts of things they think they don't know. And if you consider the therapy techniques which I describe in the disown self, I think you can see that they all follow that pattern. And I want to explain to you a little bit about the thinking behind my different techniques. Because if you understand one general theory that is behind them all, that will help you to understand how to use the particular technique I'm going to talk about later on this record today. Let's begin with this example. Suppose that I were to say to one of you, what did you receive from your parents for your 15th birthday? The chances are very good that you would say, I don't remember, I haven't the faintest idea. And certainly you wouldn't be lying to me. But now let's imagine that you were put under hypnosis, and under hypnosis you were taken back to the time of your 15th birthday, which is pretty easy to do, you might be interested to learn. Why then, you would see and remember and know what you receive from your parents for your 15th birthday, and you would have the knowledge, and so you would be able to tell me. That may sound a bit strange to you if you have no knowledge of hypnosis, but in fact, as I've already said, it's a quite simple operation to perform and to achieve. Now, what I want you to observe is what happened here. When I asked you for that information and you said, I don't know, that was true relative to the particular mental state you were in when asked the question. But by changing your mental state, in that case via hypnosis, by changing your ego state, let's call it that, by changing your ego state, I was able, or the hypnotist was able, to make information available to you that was not available to you in your prior mental state or your prior ego state. Now, suppose, by contrast, that I ask you the population of some small town in Australia of which you have never heard. Now, in that case, we could use hypnosis or we could use any number of conceivable techniques, but there would be no way to extract that information from you simply because, in no sense 
whatever doesn't exist in any part of your brain. So that in the second case, in answer to the inquiry about the population of that small town in Australia, if you said, I don't know, that I don't know would be true in the absolute sense. Whereas in the first case, about your 15th birthday present, when you said, I don't know, that was true relative to a given mental state or a given psychological frame of reference or a given ego state. And so by changing that ego state, something that you didn't know that wasn't available to you now becomes available to you. And in my way of doing counseling or therapy, all of the techniques that I use, and I have many that are not yet described in my writing, but a few of them are in the disowned self, and I'll use some examples from there to help to dramatize what I'm talking about. All of these techniques involve, in one way or another, altering the individual's mental state, altering his ego state, so that something important that was not previously available to him in the earlier ego state becomes available to him in the changed ego state. Here's an example taken not from the disowned self, but from breaking free. Perhaps you'll remember in one of the chapters I asked a client what he felt about his parent, his father, when he was a young boy. And the client says something like, oh, I don't know, I liked him, I suppose. And then I said to him something like this, I'm quoting from memory. I said something like this, close your eyes and take a long, slow, deep breath and let your whole body relax. You're seven years old and you're alone in the house and you're playing. Now you hear footsteps outside the door. Daddy is coming home. The door opens. Daddy enters. What are you feeling? And the client then said, I hope he's in a good mood. I hope he's not upset and gets angry. I get scared when he's in an upset mood. And right away from that little exchange, which took maybe 60 seconds, the client gained important insight to something about his childhood, and I did. And I helped him to gain access to this information by using a very simple technique, simply to alter his mental state, and suddenly new information became available to him. Okay, that's the same principle. Now, perhaps you'll remember a rather humorous technique I describe in the disowned self where I might ask a client some question and he says, I don't know. And then I say, fine, I accept the fact that you don't know. But if you did know, what would you answer? And many, many times, most of the time, the client then gives me the answer. Now that may sound very strange because it's not my assumption that he was lying in the first case. Now what was the nature of the ego-altering state here? Well, suppose that he had some block against knowing or there was some repression or he didn't know where to look for the answer, or he didn't know how to introspect, or there was some resistance to knowing or to naming his motive in words, or naming whatever it was we wanted to find out in words. So in effect, when I ask him the question, a little block is thrown up. And the technique consists of removing that block, of relaxing the mind. How do I do that? Well, I say, first of all, fine. I accept the fact that you don't know. As soon as I do that, in effect, it takes the duty away. It takes the obligation away. It takes the gun away from his head. His mind relaxes. Then I say, but if you knew, and as soon as I say, if you knew, you see, I take him into fantasy. I take him into imagination. I remove the obligation for him to give, quote, the right answer or the true answer. I loosen up or free his mind. What might you say? What might the answer be? And then, because I've taken the gun away from his head, in effect, he's able to answer me, and he does answer me. Now, take a more sophisticated example, the deathbed exercise, which I describe in The Disowned Self, where if I want to explore a person's relationship to his parents in childhood, I ask the person to lie down and to relax and close his eyes, and to imagine that he's lying in the hospital room dying, he's dying, and then I imagine him talking to one or another of his parents at his deathbed. I ask him to imagine this, and he begins to talk, and he kind of temporarily breaks free of the context of his everyday life. He kind of is suspended in space. He accepts the idea his life is over. He's got nothing to lose. And he begins talking in a very intimate, often very explosive way to his parents and all sorts of memories begin to burst forth and emotions burst forth and very often when the exercise is over the person who has been working will tell me you know 
if you had told me in advance that that's what went on between me and my parents, or that's what I felt, or that's what I thought, I would have been astonished. And yet, when we do the deathbed exercise, we alter the ego state, and all that information comes out.